Welcome to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. Today, we're going to talk about urban permaculture. Permaculture is an approach to land management that incorporates principles found in healthy ecosystems. It's a response to industrial farming's fertilized monocrops and deforested CAFO-based livestock systems. These industrial farming techniques are responsible for 24% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That's 24% more than all the trucks, cars, planes, trains, and ships in the entire world. Permaculture makes people and local communities self-reliant from an industrial economy that is responsible for most of the planet's ecological damage. Permaculture was originally a contraction of permanent agriculture, but was later expanded to include social and cultural concepts of community and living in harmony with nature, thus becoming a contraction for permanent culture. Permaculture draws on indigenous or traditional knowledge to create sustainable, nourishing, distributed food systems that actually help fight climate change. Regenerative agriculture is the application of permaculture techniques to commercial farming. Urban permaculture applies those same principles to our backyards and vacant lots, giving us access to economical, healthy food, the natural stress relief of interacting with nature, and the community resilience of local food sources, all while saving the planet by sequestering carbon in our yards and lowering the climate impact of industrial farming. You know, that's a lot of win-win scenarios. So we're joined on Zoom today by Dan Krill with the Mannheim Park Garden Conservancy. Hi, Dan. Hey, Bob, thank you. Hillary Noonan with Mad Hatter Compost Tea. Hi, Hillary. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Maggie St. John with the Green Goddess Sanctuary. Hi, Maggie. Hi, Bob. Thanks, everyone. Hi. Michael Allman with Forest Floor Permaculture. Hi, Michael. Hi there, Bob and everybody else. Sean Stanton with Integrated Earth Design. Hi, Sean. Hey, Bob and everyone. Grateful to be here. And Dylan Cochran. Hi, Dylan. Hi, Bob. How's it going? Dan, I'd like to start with you. You're the president of the Mannheim Park Garden Conservancy. Conservancy. So tell us about your space. Well, uh, Mannheim Park Community Garden or Mannheim Gardens, as we refer to it, is one of the largest and oldest community gardens in Kansas City. It's in the historic Mannheim Park neighborhood. And it's uh, basically the entire 4200 block of Forest Avenue on the west side. It's about an acre of land. And over the past six years, our conservancy has owned and operated the space, but it has been used for growing food for decades. Um, going back to, I've heard stories from 40 years ago of a, an old woman who grew tomatoes for the neighborhood up in the space. Um, and there've been various other iterations starting in the late eighties or early nineties. Our current iteration has turned it into what it is today. And we have a gathering space, a stage for performances. Uh, we've had three, well, we're working on our third wedding, uh, which is this next weekend, our third wedding coming up. Uh, we have a permaculture pond that captures water off a nearby building. We have a flock of chickens and ducks and turkeys, um, playground space, and we grow tons and tons of food for ourselves and for our neighbors in a nutshell. Yeah, and nuts too, I assume. In a nutshell. Yes, there are nuts in the food forest, yes. <laughs> so so what, what kind of food are you growing? Vegetables, fruits, nuts? I mean, what does your um, garden look like? Well, it's so it's split into thirds, basically. The, the southern half is, or southern third is um, mostly private raised beds where people grow their own food. And then the central area is a gathering space. And then the northern section is uh, public beds where we all work together. Um, we grow just common vegetable crops, anything that people feel, you know, motivated to grow. Um, some, we do some things every year as tradition, uh, for instance, sweet potatoes, excuse me, and uh, peanuts and, um, you know, Irish potatoes or Peruvian potatoes, uh, tomatoes, that sort of thing. And then we also have a food forest. It's about an eighth of an acre uh, on a lot that we purchased that's just to the north of it. And in there, there's various fruit trees, uh, nut bearing trees and, um, you know, different parts of understory bushes that produce fruit and vegetables for, for humans. So, mm -hmm. 
And so the urban location, I mean, we're talking about what were probably originally vacant lots, or maybe there used to be houses that got torn down, but, you know, vacant land surrounded by urban homes. Um, do, do you find that the community interacts with the garden or the garden acts as a hub for that immediate community? Yeah, it can. It's, it, it is right in the middle of a midtown neighborhood and it's a little bit up on a hill. So we have that um, kind of going for us and against us. Um, these people don't always know that there's actually a garden up there. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny. Sometimes the garden being a little bit secluded gives people the idea that it's not for them, that it's like a private space. And so we have to sort of invite people constantly. And one of the ways that we've gotten around that is by having two big parties every year. We call them the spring fling and the harvest fest. So one in the spring, one in the fall. And we invite the neighborhood. We interact with the um, neighborhood association and try and get as many people out to the garden as possible. And that's, you know, partially just because we want to share the space and have a big party and partially selfishly we want to get people to come and volunteer because that's the only way the place works and you know it's 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 actually how I became a member um, six years ago I went to the spring fling and I, I had just wanted to raise bed but just sitting down and sharing a meal with all these different people from all these different backgrounds in this neighborhood it was just very inspiring and I thought you know this is a cool place and there's a lot to be done here and I decided to start volunteering on a regular basis and now six years later we've done really amazing things and and uh, yeah, we have a we have a Sunday workday every Sunday, and everybody's invited. Uh, I think we just started calling them uh, Steward Sundays, uh, but I still call them Sunday workday. And um, we do that every Sunday all year round, 52 weeks a year, uh, no matter what the weather is. There might only be two people in the cold part of the year, but uh, and then you know we, we find that the get-togethers and teaching classes and these sorts of things draw people in and you know maybe one in 10 or 20 people actually stay and hang out it's kind of hard to get volunteers to hang out you know uh, but when we get them they they stick around so it sounds like you're a perfect example of that cultural aspect of permaculture where you're bringing community together you know there's social interaction there's shared meals so i think that's great absolutely Michael, let's jump over to you. You have like a half acre urban permaculture site in Lawrence, I believe, and that that's your yard. Is this a suburban location? Uh, yes, uh, this is Michael. Um, I'm in Lawrence, Kansas, first of all, and the place that where I live is a half acre that I call forest floor permaculture. And I've been developing that site um, for about 40 years now. Uh, the first 15 years maybe or so, didn't really know much about permaculture, what I was doing, but it was a learning curve. Um, and that's pretty much my, my personal involvement with permaculture, um, growing basically a food forest um, containing swales and berms for water catchment, which uh, works really well for the blueberries. Um, I also though work in the context of the public policy with a not-for-profit here, Sustainability Action Network, focusing on other aspects of permaculture like the county is considering industrial scale solar. And I introduced the, the concept of agrivoltaics where diversity of food can be grown in and among the solar collectors so we don't lose the farmland. Uh, just local food promotion. Um, some years ago, the group started what we call the Perma Commons Community Garden, very similar to what Dan Kroll is doing, but not on the scale. It's not a half block, it's one lot, um, but doing the same kind of thing with a, a cooperative, commonly shared permaculture site, also mm -hmm. a food forest. Um, and then also locally, I'm working uh, with a sustainability group to develop a natural landscaping ordinance for the city to replace their, what they call a weed ordinance. Every city has a weed ordinance. Well, we don't think of them as weeds. So we're working on uh, coming up with a whole new ordinance that allows and actually promotes permaculture and natural landscaping. So I, I kind of do things all over the place. Um, my, my own forest floor permaculture, um, 
it's it's kind of interesting at this point in the time i'll be sponsoring um a field day for the kansas permaculture institute this saturday for a class they do i do that every year um the kind of plants i'm growing um nuts and fruit trees berry bushes and some vegetables um it's interesting that my diet uh, restricts me now from eating nuts. <laughs> um, I have a kidney issue. So the kind of food that I can eat for my kidneys is doesn't include nuts, but still I grow the trees because the food forest is, you know, it's a, it's a multi-layered as the permaculture designers know, um, vertical uh, permaculture and the nut trees are an integral part of that. Um, so that's it, like Dan said, in a nutshell. Um, Very good. So. That sounds like a wonderful place and sounds like you're also engaged in a lot of other aspects of permaculture, which we'll talk about later. Um, Dylan, let's jump over to you. You have a permaculture site in your backyard and you know, you're, you're living urban. What's that like? It's a mixed bag for sure. Um, we do I really do love working out in the in the yard and in the garden. Um, it gives me all those endorphins I need to help with my mental health. I get to grow stuff, eat eat the fresh food. It's just so I don't know. It, it, it's very powerful um, and tasty. But um, so, there's some people out there that just don't get it. And you know, I I feel like one of the best ways to sort of bridge that gap is to by by doing it and and showing people that it's normal and normalizing this kind of thing so that's kind of where i'm at here but i i love it it's 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 i wouldn't trade it for anything really is that so i mean your entire your entire yard backyard is given over to this permaculture garden my entire backyard front yard and side yards too actually i have um I can show, I have it right here. You can see it. I mean, I don't know, I, on the radio, you obviously can't see it, but um, it's my whole backyard here. I have a spiral garden. I have a chicken and rabbit area, um, compost, and my front yard is native perennials um, and fruit trees and stuff too, so. So that's, that's very cool. And, and mm -hmm. for our radio listeners, he just panned his camera on Zoom. Yeah, I just showed, showed people, that. yeah. Hillary, let's jump over you. I mean, your business focuses on soil, you know, Matt Hatter tea compost and building that up. Obviously, that's a huge component of permaculture. I think everybody in this room spends a lot of time working on their soil. Why is that so important? Um, so I found permaculture uh, when I was looking for regenerative design back in, I don't know, 2007, maybe. Um, and Permaculture is a really good toolkit. Um, it's not necessarily regenerative. Um, my, my permaculture class was not science-based, which was really frustrating. So I had to go out and find the science after, after I got my certification. Um, and so I, the difference there is that permaculture is a set of actions um, things that you can do um, to be regenerative, that's results oriented. So for your soil to be regenerative, for your farm to be regenerative, you would actually have to show that you're building carbon um, and um, that you're pushing your photosynthesis rates up so you're storing more carbon. And that, that's, I mean, when we talk about climate issues here on the climate era, that's the whole thing about permaculture. Um, you know, it's sequestering carbon from the air, helping remove that, helping lower the carbon greenhouse gas effect. Something all of us can do, whether that's going into the soil or into your vegetables or into those large nut trees that you may or may not be able to eat. Sean. You, you provide services that are focused on edible landscaping and social permaculture. Can you talk about that? That's, a, that's interesting concepts. Yeah, so, you know, my, uh, my work really started um, in permaculture, more like physical, hands-on. A lot of experience came through Antioch Urban Growers, which you'll hear more about with Maggie. Um, but lately, it's, it's shifted into uh, a more remote 
uh, aspect of permaculture design. And so I, I, I tend to stick to more edible landscaping as the term because I don't get to practice the number one principle of permaculture, which is observation. And so, uh, you know, right now my, my ultimate goal is really connecting people to healthy food and, you know, regenerating their health through regenerate, regenerating the land. And so a lot of work goes into the soil and I, uh, yeah, that's, that's really where a lot of my focus on is just connecting with people and helping them design backyard food forests and, and even market farms. I've been getting a lot of, um, uh, interest in, you know, market production and the sort of permaculture with permaculture principles, regenerative ag. So the, the whole social permaculture you talked about is that connecting people to the food, engaging them with, with what's happening in their backyard or somebody else in their community. Right. Yeah. So for most of America, what I've, what I've kind of come to terms with is the fact that we are almost a culturalist society. <laughs> and uh, at least in my own background, I mean, I obviously there's some cultural aspects, but nothing that, you know, is Gener been passed on by you know generations and so uh in a way i'm bringing permaculture uh, like using that as a platform to essentially create culture uh in mass very nice and a lot of it has uh, to do with food <laughs> yeah absolutely um maggie as sean just mentioned the the antioch urban growers and i know you personally have your green goddess sanctuary so tell us about those I'd love to, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I am an urban farmer. I have a one acre farm I, I, I call a Green Goddess Sanctuary. I actually got my permaculture design certificate from Hillary and Michael back in 2016. They were the instructors of my permaculture design course. So it's such an honor to be in this conversation with them here. Um, and ever since then, it's just been a whirlwind of stuff <laughs> going on. Um, I started converting my backyard from a traditional American backyard. It was a full acre of lawn. I had two trees, <laughs> that was it. It now has chickens and ducks and goats and a mini fruit tree orchard. And I've got annual vegetable gardens and all sorts of other things, flower gardens established, native, na native plants going everywhere, like all sorts of stuff. Um, all because of permaculture, right? Also, um, in 2017, I started with uh, partnering up with Mark up at Antioch Urban Growers in Kansas City, Missouri, and they, Antioch Urban Growers is a sustainable living initiative. They are the host farm for Kansas City's uh, Sustainable Living Future, and it's a really heavy focus on education, teaching people a love of nature, and a building community. Uh, we have uh, uh, regenerative uh, gr gardening classes uh, all day Saturdays, or actually no, Saturday mornings now. We're doing that from April through um, October for free. Anybody wants to show up, they can participate in the gardening classes that day. So uh, it's a, it really is that focus on getting people connected with their food, because when people connect with their food, a lot of how they interact with the world and with each other just changes. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's a, a you're all you're all investing a lot of time and money into your sites, you know, your your you, either your gardens or your service. I'd like to just go around the room and ask each of you why permaculture is important to you. And you know, just a quick reply. Let's start with Dylan. Why is permaculture so important? I really believe that we should be not just extracting from nature i feel like we should be giving back to and there's no reason why we can't do that um and and have everything that we need and want to survive so that's my main thing and also for the mental health reasons it's it's nice to to be part of that connected system that connected whole and when you eat food that you grew yourself that was grown in a good way you know you can really feel that i think so that's mine well thank you dan why is permaculture important to you? Well, I mean, as, as someone who does it as a volunteer at Mannheim, but also does it as a, a career, I would say, you know, I might have a selfish perspective in saying it may be our only hope to continue as a species on the planet is to learn to interact with the with the ecosystem as it stands. 
Um, I tend to lean more scientifically like Hillary uh, on, the, on the approach to these sorts of things. There, there are ways of vetting scientific experiments by saying how, you know, how, what kind of a data set is available? You know, who's been running the experiment the longest that we can look to? Nature has been figuring out the best way to feed every animal that lives on the planet and every plant and everything that lives here uh, for billions of years. And that experiment has the best data set. So why not just mimic it? Uh, and plug ourselves into it and, and try to interact. Our, our alternative is that we're gonna destroy our ability to survive on this planet. And we already are, we have um, in many ways. And, and so I guess what I'm trying to do is bring this, um, this freight train to a halt before we careen off the side of a mountain and you know, we just don't have any other options. So I, I take it pretty seriously, Bob. <laughs> it sounds like the whole freight train. That's that's an interesting metaphor. Hillary, let's jump to you. Why is permaculture important? Very much for the same reason. Um, we have realistically less than 10 years before we will not be able to grow food outside. So as our systems are breaking down, it will be more important than ever that people understand how to grow food for themselves. Um, it's not a happy picture, but it is something that we can change. We don't have to continue with extractive systems. We can change that, we can make it healthier. We can restore a stabilized weather system, at least for our region. Um, and as more regions come online doing that, we can restore the thermals. All of that is part of the system. And if we just work with the system, instead of thinking we're smarter or we're better, um, we can get back to health. Well, this really isn't that far removed from what was done not that long ago. I remember when I was young, my grandparents having the garden. I mean, they were running permaculture, even though they didn't call it that. So, I mean, what we're talking about is that not that far removed from what we used to do in American society. Maggie, why yeah. is permaculture important to you? Oh, permaculture for me is it's like freedom. It really is freedom. Um, uh, de dependence on um, you know, knowing how to grow your own food. It, there is there is power and freedom there. <clears throat> not being have, having to depend on anyone else to be able to survive or any other system or entity or anything like that, right? Um, and I think that's something that's going to be important in the future, uh, knowing how to feed oneself in any conditions. So it, permaculture is important to me for our future, the future of our planet, the future of our species. Um, it's also just important um, I mean, I could make up a whole bunch more stuff, but really that's about it. It's just it, living in such a way where we are mimicking what the mother has already figured out how to do. And we just quit monkeying with it, trying to think we can do better than the mother. Well, the thing that strikes me about that is our, our modern industrial food systems, we're, we're shipping, we're transporting food around the world. You know, we, I think I mentioned earlier, the irradiation, you know, all of that too pick up a product that's made in South America or Asia and move it to our supermarket, you know, the local store. That's a lot of carbon overhead. I mean, the yeah. massive amount of carbon and, you know, the quality of the food, the, the nutritional value of the food that you can grow in your backyard is going to be so much superior to that stuff we're moving around the world, not to mention the economic impact of, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but it seems like I spend a third of my income on food these days, and that's a lot of money. Michael, let's jump to you. Why is permaculture so important? Uh, this is Michael. Um, very good points made by the previous speakers, particularly about, like Hillary said, 10 years, it's gonna be really difficult for people to grow food anymore because of the climate change. Um, for permaculture, one of the main uh, design principles is capturing water. And considering that drought is, is, and flooding is getting worse and worse, you know, that water element is gonna be crucial. And one of the best ways 
to capture water is through the earthworks that we can do in permaculture, berms and swales and what have you, but also simply by increasing the amount of carbon in the soil. Um, degraded soil is maybe 2% carbon um, or 2% organic matter, whereas healthy soil is about 10%. And the, the standard ratio is that uh, carbon is 58% of the soil organic matter. So the more carbon, the more organic matter, the more water, it's about nine times by weight amount of water that uh, organic matter can hold in the soil. Um, the other aspect of being able to grow our food through permaculture is like Bob, you mentioned that the transportation of food all over the place, average of 1500 miles for the, the typical meal from source to your plate, that's the average. Um, that's all fossil fuel carbon. That's more atmospheric carbon. Uh, permaculture not only will allow local food growing in urban settings where it's going to be used on site, uh, but it also doesn't use fossil carbon fertilizers, pesticides, things like that. So there's any number of ways that permaculture um, will not only uh, reduce climate emissions, but also address uh, global biodiversity loss um, through the monoculture and the tearing down of the Amazon rainforest for cattle grazing, things like that. Um, Thank you. So that's enough said right there. Sean, why is permaculture important to you? Well, I have to just agree with everyone, kind of all nailed it. But for me, uh, permaculture is really important to me, um, specifically with the, the tool set and platform it provides, you know, the, uh, the core ethics of permaculture, earth care, people care and care of the future is one iteration of that. And so that element of care has just been, especially with my life right now, I've been having so many health issues and seeing it everywhere everyone I know has some sort of health issue. And to me, permaculture is that per perfect platform to, to heal and be healed. And so that's really become my mission. You're listening to The Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. We're speaking with Dan Krill, Dylan Cochran, Hillary Noonan, Maggie St. John, Michael Allman, and Sean Stanton about urban permaculture. So I'm ready to build a food forest in my backyard. You know, I want the fresh, healthy food that hasn't been GMO'd or irradiated, wrapped in plastic, transported halfway around the world. You know, all those things we've been talking about. I assume that we're looking at different layers of food of, you know, root vegetables in the ground, maybe leafy greens and mushrooms on the surface. You've talked about nut and berry bushes, fruit trees above that, perhaps that upper canopy of tall nut trees. How long is this going to take and how much time am I going to have to invest each week? Sean, you want to start with that? Well, I, I always like to start with context when it comes to, you know, especially talking permaculture and food forests. Um, I mean, I've built, you know, permaculture farms on a third or a sixteenth of an acre with chickens and a little mini food forest and I joyfully spent 30 minutes each day and to me it didn't seem like work but you know a lot of the work is is putting these systems in and you know that could be a lot of time and money or you know it, it just it all depends on the context but ultimately I don't find it as work and, you know I find it more as like a joyful experience. So you're talking about maybe half an hour a day working in your backyard connecting to nature um a mature food forest like that how, i mean we're talking several years to establish that yeah it, and it very much depends um but typically yeah i mean if you buy like an already grafted cultivar you know fruit tree it still takes two to three years to get a really small yield and around you know year five that's when you start seeing a significant difference uh the nut trees are a little bit different some will produce around that same time frame and some take nine, 12 years or even more sometimes. Okay, so we're talking a long-term pro process. Yeah, it's a, it's a generational offering. <laughs> generational offering, great phrase. Michael, you, you said you've been working on your, your 
permaculture, your food forest for um, 40 years. How, how long does it take? I mean, we're, and we're talking to our listeners that want to get started now. What kind of return can they see short term? I mean, what's the first thing that's going to be coming out of their food forest? Well, um, first of all, you need to design it, and that's going to take some time if you want to uh, create a setting that um, you know becomes productive quickly. So the first thing you would want to design is the uh, earthworks. You know what you're going to do with the terrain. Because once, once you have things planted, you're not going to be able to moving soil around hardly at all. I mean, maybe wheelbarrows full, but to build swales and berms, it's going to take, um, you know, a good year just to physically construct that and then put in the cover crop, um, add some mulch, uh, get it to a point where you can plant it the next season. What kind of things you plant there is going to determine on the how fast you get production. You know, some uh, uh, dwarf fruit trees could be producing in three years. Uh, generally, people do, tend to go with uh, semi-dwarf or full size, and they will take five, six, seven years, depending on the, on the species and the variety. Um, but you can always start, you know, with berry bushes, which is a good idea to be planting along with the trees. And those should be bearing something within three years. Um, the, the challenge is for, <laughs> for most of us is how much money we have to spend at any given time. And for me, I didn't have a lot of money and I still don't, you know, in any given year. So did it kind of step-by-step -step piecemeal. Whereas if you can, if you can invest a whole lot and design the whole site and plant it all at once within one or two years, you know, that's ideal, but few of us can, can manage that. So you can plan on doing a sequence over a period of years as you uh, work the whole site. Sure, so, you know, if, if we've got the investment to make, you can have this whole thing up and running in three years, or at least a major portion of it, it sounds like you know, buying the expensive you know, things that are already started. But as Michael's saying, for most of us, you're probably going to start with a smaller subset and then kind of expand over the years. You know, what Sean calls that generational contribution. Dan, what about you um, in terms of getting that garden up and running? Are you using a lot of um, uh, local plants? I mean, do you, do you kind of focus on what's local to your area? Well, well, I would not. Um, I would say yes, uh, for sure, absolutely. Um, which is certainly a, a permaculture principle. You know, find out what grows in your area already. You know, why fight to uh, try and keep things alive that want to die and kill things that don't want to die? You know, um, but uh, you know, to answer your your previous question, um, I agree with. Michael, that you know, the first thing you want to do is lay out your earthworks and figure out the water on your site, and whether that's a, you know, an eighth of an acre like we have at Mannheim, or whether that's ten acres, um, you know, setting up your earthworks and and putting in berms and swales if you need them, and permaculture ponds and water sources and that sort of thing is your first layer. Beyond that, though, I, I approach it a little bit differently. I mean, I try and think of the food forest as a successional. Uh, environment if I can if I can make it as such and so you know of course the trees aren't going to produce right away some of them like the nut producing trees it might take 15 years for you to get a good harvest off of them um, but in the meantime you have all that space underneath them that you can grow annual crops and so you know like what I did at Mannheim is we brought in um, leaves and and other compostable materials and laid them down and then our cover crops um, were annual vegetables uh, like sweet potatoes squash um, you know uh, cantaloupe pumpkins uh, tomatoes things like that that would cover the ground take up space that the weeds wanted to take up feed the soil with the root exudates but also produce food for people and it's really those green growing things pumping sugars into the soil that starts to convert the site 
And as the trees fill in and you keep them, you know, happy, uh, you'll see that that successional progress from a very bacterially dominated, you know, annual crop system to a more fungally dominated perennial uh, culture system. And you can harvest food, huge amounts of food from it um, in the first year if you if you set it up correctly as you wait for those trees to come in. And I would say on this on the idea of expense too. There is no reason to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to start a, a permaculture food forest. Um, you know, if you go out and buy grafted trees that are already, you know, a name varietal, you're certainly going to get what you paid for and you're going to pay a lot of money for it. But there's ways of buying, for example, seedlings or planting your own seeds and growing your own apple trees um, where it's very cheap. You can buy you know, uh, very small trees in large numbers and sell some to pay for the cost of the other trees, for example. Um, you know, you have to kind of, uh, what I try and get people to do is let go of this, um, this idea that every tree has to thrive on your site and survive to be 100 years old. Plant some and let them die. It doesn't matter, you know, if, or if you plant a seed and it grows up and the fruit's no good, cut it down and use it to smoke some bacon or make some mushrooms or something like that, you know? Um, just do it more like nature does it. Just throw a bunch of trees out there and let them fight for the space and see who comes out. And if you do that, there's ways of saving money in the process and while, this, while the system kind of matures and does its thing, so. So it sounds like you are doing an evolving, uh, maturing food forest, starting out with those annual crops where you're gonna get an immediate return that season and then letting the longer term bushes trees come in when they're, you know, as they mature. And I, and I would say, Bob, this can be done not just on an urban lot, but on thousands of acres. And, you know, if you take the permaculture food forest idea and you spread it out over a thousand acres and, you know, you put in your earthworks and you plant trees in, in a thoughtful way, um, as that fills in, you can graze animals on it and produce healthful meats. You can improve the, the soil through the rotational grazing. You can grow annual crops in between as that forest matures. And then, you know, 10, 20 years from now, start harvesting that uh, perennial crop. So, you know, this is not just something that we can do in our backyard. Obviously, it's fun to do, but um, this is the answer to how we survive on the planet and, and produce our staple um our staple carbohydrates from perennial cropping trees that can live for hundreds or even thousands of years. So, very nice. So, what is the role of livestock in urban permaculture? Let's start with, with Dylan. I mean, all of us has kind of hit on that. Is is the livestock part of the system? Well, for me, um, I've always loved having backyard chickens and uh, that in a small space, you can totally have a flock. I mean, in Kansas City, Missouri, you can have up to 15 um, chickens over four months of age in your yard as long as more than 100 feet away from your neighbor's yard. So for me, it's an essential part. Um, those chickens drop a lot of manure, which is very nitrogenous. You can compost that and use that in the rest of the garden. You always get, you're getting good eggs. You're, and they can also even be used to um, keep down pests. You can wrote, uh, you can like use a chicken tractor and get them to like pick out all the pests from your beds after they're done. You know, it's it's very important. I, I like it. I'm working on getting them back this year. So that's my two. And do you eat them? I mean, is that part of the, the food forest, if you will? Is that a, a meat product you're using? Yes, I do eat the chickens. Um, and in Kansas City, you can actually raise up to 50 chickens that are under four months old. So that allows you to raise meat birds and egg layers as well in, in the same plot of land, basically. So for me, it's important, but you don't necessarily, I mean, chickens are really easy to take care of actually too, and rabbits as well. They're very good permaculture animals. You could basically feed them all the weeds that you pick up from your garden and they'll make more rabbits very easily. You know how rabbits multiply, right? So, and they're very nutritious, all that, so. Uh, Michael, uh, do, do I understand correctly that you're you're vegan? So for you, livestock is that part of your permaculture? Um, how does that fit into your model? Well, uh, this is Michael. Unfortunately, no, um, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> um, so if if I do need that manure kind of nitrogen, which you know is, is an excellent source, you know I'll get some horse manure and bring it in. That's not ideal. I mean, really, 
the, the optimal kind of permaculture does include some kind of livestock. Uh, it's, it's more of a whole system that way. Mm -hmm. Maggie, what about you? Do you have livestock on your green goddess sanctuary? I do. <laughs> I do. I actually first got goats uh, because when I first did my, got my permaculture certificate, mowing the lawn made no sense anymore. It just made no sense to just spend a non-renewable natural resource to continuously harvest a crop that never produces a yield. It didn't make any sense. So I started, I got goats and I started rotationally grazing them. <clears throat> Uh, in the in the space I had available because I had let the grass go up real tall and I got a citation from my city that said I couldn't do that. But there was no ordinance on record that said I couldn't have goats. So I put goats back there and they took care of it. Um, and it was great. It was great. I started just kind of accidentally rebuilding the soil accidentally. And now I've got uh, chickens. So the kind of goats I have now are fiber goats. They are pygmy angora fiber goats. They uh, produce milk, they produce babies. They produce fiber, angora fiber that I can, as a fiber artist, I can weave into clothes, textiles, hats. I mean, just whatever, right? And it's all natural fibers. And then with the chickens and the ducks, um, I have them mostly free ranging for the insect control and for the, um, they don't have access to the annual gardens, but they have access to the, uh, the understory that's developing in my food forest of my, you know, fruit trees and my nut trees and whatnot. Um, I like the ducks in an urban environment a whole lot better than chickens because um, they don't, most of the time they don't know they can fly. And so they don't ever hop the fence. <laughs> so they're not going and visiting my neighbors. Although my neighbors love my chickens to death. They just love them. They feed them intentionally. But uh, that the, sometimes the city doesn't quite understand why my, why, why my chickens in my neighbor's yard. But the ducks, they don't know they can fly. They stay put. That's interesting. And you're getting some larger, I mean, chickens, rabbits, the Dylan are talking about, but goats and stuff, I mean, some larger animals kind of brings us to that question of zoning. I mean, cities are going to look at this differently. Um, Hillary, you have animals. What's your experience with zoning issues? Um, zoning issues are pretty thorny. Um, <laughs> in my neighborhood, we're not allowed to have row crops, so none of my crops are in a row. Um, and I just, you know, <laughs> really row crops. Um, we're working on the nuisance laws in Kansas City. There's a lot that needs to be done in terms of um, the rules and regulations around this stuff. A lot of it is a part of the resilience plan. Um, so people in the city are aware of it. We're working on that uh so hopefully we we move through that pretty quickly and it becomes a model for other smaller towns around so the resilience plan you're talking about kansas city missouri's yes climate resilience plan um addressing those permaculture maybe some zoning issues so that that's interesting um absolutely making it a, making it possible for people to feed themselves and their neighbors uh, Dan, any zoning issues with the Mannheim Garden? Well, it's just, you know, what happens at Mannheim with animals stays at Mannheim. We don't need to tell the city about it. No, I just, uh, you know, I would say that the, the zoning laws about animals in Kansas City are fairly good compared to some places, first off. Um, for example, you can keep, I think it's up to three straight tailed pigs. Um, they consider them kind of the same way they do dogs. So that's, that's a way of raising some serious food in your yard if you wanted to. Um, the chickens, you know, being able to keep 15 hens is a great deal. Um, and then, you know, as was mentioned before, being able to raise your own meat birds as long as they're under four months of age, it's a great deal. A lot of those zoning laws were put in place because of the way people keep animals makes a nuisance. Like we keep them in confined areas and they poop and they stink. And, you know, when you put them in the context of a permaculture system and you and you put the animal in context of the way it's supposed to live, uh, that isn't an issue. So, so, you know, I think that just like the weed laws, we have to kind of change people's aesthetic perception of what is beautiful and we have to go and fight to change the laws um, and set the example. 
Uh, we have to do the same thing with the animals. And I think that, you know, it's possible to go a, a long distance in the, in the way towards growing our own food in our yards, as long as we do it in a way where we don't create nuisances or health issues for our neighbors. Um, and I will say too, that there's no, you know, ecological system on this planet that evolved, you know, in the absence of animals, right? So, you know, they close a lot of loops and they, and they just bring things to a head faster. Obviously you can do it without them, but man, I mean, you know, rabbits were mentioned before a couple of rabbits over a period of a season can make enough babies to make you know, hundreds, even over a thousand pounds of meat. Um, two yards of manure that you can use for composting or for food, for, you know, direct fertilizer for your garden. And they eat weeds, they'll eat the trimmings off of your, your vegetable plants. Um, and they make a healthful protein product for you. And, it, you know, this is not something that we should be ignoring, especially when, you know, we're having food problems or food crises or, uh, you know, raising the cost of food and that sort of thing. So. So we're kind of talking about bringing in these domesticated animals to build the ecosystem. I mean, they're part of the system, as, as Dan is saying. What about wild animals? What role do they play in your, you know, your, your permaculture gardens? Are they, are they something we want to invite and build into the system, or are they something you kind of fight against? Michael, you want to talk about that? Well, I, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, raising nut trees is a challenge in an urban setting because of squirrels. <laughs> uh, there are other animals that could be a problem, you know, like raccoons or possums or whatever. Um, they're not as frequently visiting my place, at least, but squirrels are, are endemic. They're everywhere. And uh, the one problem with dealing with them, I mean, people often say, well, just shoot them. Well, there's laws against discharging a firearm in the city. Um, so trapping them, that's you know, a possibility. Or having a dog. Uh, my half acre is basically, my gosh, uh, maybe a quarter, maybe not quite a quarter mile perimeter around it. I'm not going to fence it so I can have a dog. Um, but trapping is, is an, op it's an op uh, option, except it takes time. You have to always be checking, then what do you do with the animal? Take it out to the countryside. If it's a kill trap, then you have to dispose of it, put it in the compost and other animals will get in there and dig it out. So it's a challenge. It definitely is. Okay. So if a listener wants to start a permaculture site, um, where do they begin? The library, Overdrive, YouTube? Uh, where would you send them? Hillary? Can, can hardly hear you, Bob. Um. Wow, there are lots of sources out there. Um, everything you mentioned, the library, YouTube, et cetera. Um, for me, I'm, I'm a soil person. So the first thing I'm gonna start with is soil and taking a look at my soil and testing my soil. Um, there, all sorts of ways of doing it. There's not one way to achieve a permaculture design. Uh, a lot of it depends on how quickly you want it to happen and how much you want to spend. But I'm going to ease the growing of everything by taking care of my soil first. Uh, when, you know, before we built all these houses, there was an amazing system here. And we've really trashed that system. So I can't just throw some compost down and say, now I have mycorrhizae. Um, and that mycorrhizae, you know, if you had boron over here and 30 feet away, you didn't have boron, it didn't matter because the mycorrhizae would shoot that boron to where it was needed. We don't have that now. So I'm going to do a soil test. I'm going to look for organic matter, I'm gonna look for biology um, and then I'll make my plan according to that. And I can grow a lot of carbon over the winter. So by microarchy, you're talking about the fungus content in the soil, you know, the, the different fungal growths that are connecting your soil together? Uh, so that's part of it. There, yeah. That whole system, you have 
this amazing array of critters in your soil. Fungi is part of it, bacteria is part of it. You want a, a balance between them. Um, you've got protozoans and amoeba and flagellates and nematodes and all <laughs> life in the soil. I'll tell you, nematodes are like the Labradors of soil microbes. You see them on a slide, they're going all over the place. They're knocking the daylights out of everything around them. They are happy. Uh, about 5% of them are root feeders. So please don't go out and buy a nematicide and kill up all the nematodes because you're killing off 90%, 95% of what you need. Anyhow, um, yeah, let's start with the soil. Absolutely. Um, are there local classes, certifications for people that want to get more into permaculture? Maggie, you want to talk about that? Oh, I don't know if I'm the right one to talk about that. I am actually not aware of local resources. I know I took a Food Not Lawns class with Kim University at UMKC, and that led down the road to <laughs> permaculture design. So right now there is the Kansas Permaculture Institute, which is based at, that's Michael. Uh, Michael knows more about that organization. He can share more about that. And I would say um, <clears throat> permies.com is like learning permaculture with through a fire hose. So it's, uh, it's a really great website to just really hear, uh, discover a lot about a lot of different aspects of permaculture, if you're at all curious. Michael, where do you send people that want to learn? Uh, well, Maggie's right. I, I would refer people to the Kansas Permaculture Institute. Um, they not only do independent permaculture design certificate site uh, uh, sessions, but they also teach PDC classes at the University of Kansas and at K-State University both. So there's num three different ways that you can take a permaculture class from KPI. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Where can our listeners go to learn more about your work, Dan? Oh, well, you can find us on Instagram, uh, Mannheim Gardens, or I'm Snake Man Dan, or you can find us on Facebook, uh, Mannheim Gardens, and on there, I'm Farmer Dan Kroll. Um, and th those would be the two quickest and easiest ways to find us and follow all the fun things that we're doing. Dylan, where would you send people to learn more about your work? So me and my partner, Lizzie, we put on, um, we have this organization, Underground Eating Project called Locavore KC, and we have underground dinner parties, basically where you can just come to my house, my farm, and eat some food that I grew, eat some locally grown food, and just see what it's about. If you want to give a donation, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. So we are on Facebook and on Instagram at Locavore KC, L-O-C-A-V-O-R-E. KC. That's where you can find us. Thank you. Hillary, where would you like some people to learn more about your work? Uh, well, I need to add a lot more to it, but there is a website, Mad Hatter Compost Tea. Um, I would like to plug, we're doing a soils ecology class at UMKC this summer. It's an eight-week class. Uh, so if you're a UMKC student and you need a science credit, this is going to be fun. Um, and admittedly, I'm I'm a dirt person, but I promise to make it fun. And Molly <laughs> is is my my big hero at UMKC, and she is a part of it. Thank you, Maggie. Where do you want to send people? All right. So for Antioch Urban Growers, you can look us up on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, we have our website AntiochUrbanGrowers.com. Green Goddess Sanctuary does not exist on any digital media platform on purpose. I'm a paranoid ex-techie, so there you go. If you need to get a hold of me directly, you can get a hold of me at maggie at antiochurbangrowers.com via email. Thank you. Thank you. Michael? Uh, well, Forest for Permaculture doesn't have a website, but uh, people want to try to get hold of me. They could use my email address, paradigm at ixks.com. Thank you. And Sean, where would you like people to go to learn more about your work? I personally like when people reach out to me in person um, on my email, uh, rootscreateculture at gmail.com. I also have a developing website right now. It's, it's not fully done, but it's still good to check out. It's at rootscreateculture.com. 
and yeah, Facebook, Instagram, I have dozens of accounts and <laughs> groups and all that. Um, but you can just look me up Sean Stanton on Facebook and it'll connect all those, those parts. Okay. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. We welcome your questions and feedback. You can learn more about the Climate Hour podcast at climategkc.org. That's climategkc.org. This is the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove.